The Rock was an icon. He was by far the biggest star in Hollywood. Not only did women say, that's the man I want to marry, many men said, that's the man I'd like to be. Hudson died quietly in his sleep this morning at his home in Beverly Hills. He was found dead by members of his household staff. It was just this past July that the word came out that he had something drastically wrong with him. It was soon after that that the truth did emerge. Rock Hudson was suffering from AIDS. On October 2nd, 1985, Hollywood actor Rock Hudson died. He was only 59. For a man who was nominated for an Academy Award and was quintessentially an icon of American cinema, the press surrounding his death was shockingly not a celebration of his career. Why is that? Died from AIDS. He was 59. He revealed he was suffering from the disease earlier this year. President Reagan said tonight he was very saddened. Because Rock Hudson was gay. Welcome to When the Pictures Got Bigger a YouTube channel exploring the history of classic Hollywood through a modern lens. In today's episode, I want to highlight the incredible life and tragic death of the legendary Rock Hudson, the first major celebrity to die of AIDS. The first cases of what would come to be known as AIDS were reported in June 1981, but the relevant story of actor Rock Hudson goes back far before that, back to the 1940s, when our world was at war. More than 16 million American men served in World War II, and those who came back were forever changed. They were haunted, shell-shocked. They were unaccustomed to the America that had evolved since they went away. And furthermore, while American men had served, American women had worked. Like all major events in history, the ripple effects of World War II and its major shift in gender roles can be found in the Hollywood films which immediately followed. After the war, actors like Marlon Brando, Montgomery Clift, and James Dean emerged, men whose masculinities were often shaky. You're tearing me apart! Hey, Stella! These men appealed to the anguished generation of 1950s filmgoers. To shell-shocked men watching movies, these actors reflected a shared sense of sadness and despair. They were actors who method acted and who seemed like they just left a therapy session right before entering the soundstage. This was a major shift away from the pre-war stars where men like Clark Gable and Cary Grant oozed masculinity onto the silver screen. And Hollywood, as always, was averse to such a change, which is why in the 1950s they found a young, handsome, six foot five man named Roy Scherer, changed his name to Rock Hudson and made him a star. Rock Hudson was a man, no doubt about it. The legend goes that he never worked out a day in his life. He had seemingly been carved from stone. And Hollywood's efforts to find a pre-war male star in a post-war world were instantly successful. I mean, he may as well have been born in a factory. Rock was tall, rugged, manly, precisely what Hollywood was looking for post-war, and a great foil to the aforementioned megastars, James Dean or Marlon Brando, who seemed to be carrying unseen demons. You're all through. Hudson really had three major claims to fame. His melodramas directed by Douglas Sirk, his romantic comedies alongside Doris Day, and his Oscar-nominated role as the lead in 1956's epic, Giant. And I personally love all three facets of Rock's career. Douglas Sirk was the king of the melodrama, and Rock Hudson was his greatest muse. There is a lot to be said about their relationship. I believe it to be almost like a father and son pairing. Douglas Sirk's only son died at 18, and he happened to have been born the same year as Rock. As Hudson put it, he was like old dad to me, and I was like a son to him, I think. I was scared and new and trying to figure out this thing, and suddenly an older man reached out and said, There, there. It's okay. That was Douglas Sirk. The duo made eight movies together, and the best of them is probably All That Heaven Allows, which sees Rock Hudson playing a young, hunky gardener named Ron Kirby. The old widowed woman whom he tends the garden of suddenly falls in love with him, in what unfolds as a contemplation on romance, age, and widowhood. Beautifully shot and acted, it is one of Hudson's most memorable and tender roles. In short, more than any other director, Douglas Sirk let Hudson play himself. Giant, on the other hand, was Hollywood forcing out the rock they wanted the world to see. 
Giant came out the year after All That Heaven Allows, and although nowadays it's probably best remembered as one of the three James Dean films, Rock Hudson actually plays the lead. And while both of the men were nominated for Academy Awards, I find Hudson's performance to be the better one. This is no knock on James Dean, but as discussed earlier, the appeal of Dean and other brooding method actors was the antithesis of who Rock was meant to be. And in a movie like Giant, an epic spanning generations, the movie rests on the shoulders of a reliably stoic lead. Dean is marvelous as Jet Rink, but the movie would not work without Rock Hudson. Still, as excellent as these dramas were, my favorite side of Rock Hudson comes from his collaborations with actress Doris Day. Together, Doris Day and Rock Hudson made three classic romantic comedies, Pillow Talk, Lover Come Back, and Semi No Flowers. The first, Pillow Talk, came out in 1959, right on the heels of Rock's Oscar-nominated turn in Giant. It was a risk for him to go from dramatic to comedic, but the risk paid off immensely. Pillow Talk was massive, the number one movie in America seven weeks in a row, and was nominated for five Academy Awards. I absolutely adore these movies, and they have a soft spot for me as some of the films my grandma loves the most. We've seen all of Doris Day's movies countless times, with Semi No Flowers and Pillow Talk being my two favorites. If I could only recommend one for you to start with, make it Flowers. It's perhaps the least screwball of them all, based on a play instead of an original script, and its subject matter is the edgiest. The film follows Rock as the hypochondriac George Kimball, who mistakes a terminally ill patient's diagnosis with his own at a routine doctor's visit. Thinking he only has a few weeks left to live, he tries to set up a future for his wife, and as you can imagine, hilarity ensues. These movies are great for a number of reasons. Tony Randall is supporting in all three, and he's always a steam stealer. And the scripts are also light and fun. There are very few comedies made today which are as fun and lighthearted as the Day Hudson movies were, and perhaps the biggest strength is just how well the two stars worked together. Day and Hudson became best friends, and although Rock had feared that soft rom-coms could ruin the manly actor image Hollywood had crafted for him, they were ultimately some of the most critically acclaimed films he ever made. When Rock was diagnosed with AIDS, Doris Day was one of the only actors to stand by his side. Even when he was very sick, Day famously invited Rock onto her talk show, Doris Day's Best Friend. So good to see you. Oh, it's great. I miss those laughs we used to have. Oh, me too. I do. We really had fun making movies. Yeah. Didn't we? Yeah. I wish we'd made more. We should do it again. Yeah, we should. It would be his final public appearance. When she was criticized for giving Rock a platform post-AIDS diagnosis, she simply responded that she just wanted to spend time with her dear friend. In 2019, just before Doris Day passed away, she had this to say about Rock Hudson. I had such fun working with my pal, Rock. We laughed our way through three films we made together and remained great friends. I miss him. Ultimately, what makes Hudson's story so tragic is that his life was never really his own. Even his name wasn't his own, and he said late in life that he always hated how Hollywood forced him to abandon his father's name to become Rock. It really was a case where Hollywood wanted a leading man, and a leading man wouldn't have been gay. The tragedy is that in any other era, Hollywood executives wouldn't have been so desperate for a manly man on the big screen, so desperate as to literally pluck some tall dude from Illinois and bring him to LA. In any other era, Hollywood wouldn't have been so controlling of Hudson's life and affairs. They were just so determined post-war to make a new male star that they simply couldn't allow him to be homosexual. In any other era, perhaps Hudson wouldn't have had to stay closeted. Discretion was the death of him. If he could have been openly gay, he may have been safer with his affairs. In short, Hollywood killed Rock Hudson the moment they made him a star. Our story ends on a happy note, however. With Rock Hudson being the first major star to die of AIDS, the public awareness of the disease increased substantially. From 1981 to 1985, AIDS was a poorly understood disease thought to affect only the margins of society. But when a megastar like Rock Hudson succumbed to it, quote, it gave cause for canonization in both the medical and gay communities. Immediately after his death, AIDS hotlines lit up across the country, with empathetic Americans offering donations and looking for more information. On September 19th, just weeks before his death, Rock had this to say, I am not happy that I have AIDS, but if that is helping others, I can at least know that my own misfortune has had some positive worth. 
Hollywood may have killed Rock Hudson, but we can be forever grateful that his death was not in vain. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, please consider liking or subscribing, and until the next time, I'll see you at the movies.